All right, guys, Murph's here, and today we're going to talk about this, a Delton Echo 316 chambered in 556. Now, eagle-eyed viewers of the channel will recognize that I have already reviewed this rifle, so if you're looking for the nitty-gritty details about all the pieces, parts, and why it is that I picked what I picked, go ahead and check out the link in the description to the original video. Now, this video will be a revisit. So we're basically going to talk over how my opinion has changed about different aspects of this rifle over time. Discuss some things from the comments section, of which there have been many comments. And then also kind of bring this more in line with my current video pattern or video methodology. So talk about recommendations, and then also go into competitive options at the end. All right, so with that, why don't we go ahead and get into a discussion of different features from the comment section and how my opinions have changed. So first off, this barrel profile. This is an M4 profile barrel. And somebody mentioned in the comment section, why did you list that as one of the things that you liked about this rifle? The M4 profile is terrible. It has none of the advantages of many modern barrels. And while that is the case, it's important to remember that any feature you have on any rifle, be it for fighting or competition or anything of those types of things, is a, con is a conscious trade-off of features. So the M4 profile was originally developed for the M4 carbine, and the idea was to have a lightweight rifle, something that was utilized by either non-combat types or those with duties on the front line other than fighting. So the whole idea was supposed to be that it would be a, a lightweight trim package. Now, that wound up not holding up because as we got into the GWAT, the M4 became more and more issued over the M16A2 because it was more applicable, M16A2 and A4 for that matter, because it was more applicable to the fighting that was going on in Iraq and Afghanistan. And special forces were very heavily utilizing the M4. Now, they started running into issues with barrel failure because this is a rather lightweight profile barrel and they were utilizing those rifles in very high round count kind of ways. They would practice a technique in which they would utilize their rifles as a method of breaking contact similar to what you would do with like a 249, so high volumes of fire. And the barrels were giving up off of that because they were not built with that in mind. Now, this touched off a little bit of discussion, a whole back and forth that eventually burst the SCAR program because Colt was like, no one else is having a problem. Maybe stop doing whatever it is that you're doing. And of course, that didn't sit well with the GBs. Ultimately, what this would wind up coming up with was the SOP mod program and the M4A1 with its heavier profile barrel. Now, I go to say all that to also point out that my original introduction to AR-15s was around the M4 profile barrel. So this barrel is a little nostalgic in its profile and why I have no issue with keeping it around. In addition to that, I don't have a giggle switch in this thing, so it's unlikely that I'm going to burn this barrel out conducting some sort of high round count, high volume and rate of fire shooting. So for those purposes, this barrel does just fine. Sure, I could throw a match barrel into this if I, I guess if I wanted to, or I could demand to have a match barrel in this, but that doesn't really meet with my purposes for the rifle. So there's that. Now, if you're looking for more of a discussion on what it is that I preference in AR-15 setups and all that kind of stuff, I do have a whole video on that, link in the description. All right, now let's talk about this twist rate. So in the original video, I stated that I wish this had a one and eight twist. That's entirely based around the fact that I prefer the one and eight twist because it stabilizes a wider variety of ammunition. If you want more discussion on twist rate, go ahead and check out the video I did a long time ago on that, link in the description. However, somebody pointed out in the comment section, and I do think it bears more discussion because this is a contextually based channel and the one and nine twist is a contextually based decision. There's nothing wrong with a one in nine twist, especially if you look at not only how this rifle is configured, but who this rifle is marketed towards. And we're gonna to start with who this rifle is marketed towards because there's kind of like two branches of that conversation. First off, this is a budget-minded rifle. So the first person this is probably marketed towards is somebody who's kind of a casual shooter. First off, it's important to keep in mind that there's nothing wrong with being a casual shooter. The right to enjoy firearms is not just based around, you know, preparing for your worst day or, or whatever. And we really lose a lot of sight of that within the gun tuber community and like Instagram influencers and all that kind of stuff where everything's all about like, well, you got to make sure that you're ready to fight the Russians or the Chinese or whoever. Where a lot of, where the vast majority of the shooting public just wants to go out and have a good time with their friends. They want to go out and just pop off a couple rounds every couple of months and, and enjoy their right to own firearms, and that's perfectly acceptable. 
So that type of person is probably buying bulk pack ammunition, 55 and 62 grain ammunition is probably steel cased. Nothing wrong with that. For discussion on steel cased ammunition, check the link in the description. But they are not going to get any more benefit out of a one in seven twist. They're going to do just fine with a one in nine twist and the type of ammunition that they're going to be purchasing. The other person that I think that this rifle was marketed towards is kind of more my crowd is somebody who's looking to progress their skill. Perhaps they are a armed professional of some type, but they can't take their duty rifle home for whatever reason. So they get this because it looks fairly similar and they set it up accordingly and they train around it. That's just fine. Or perhaps they pick up this rifle because it's relatively inexpensive. It's easy for them to be able to then start going to courses, start going to competitions, conducting their own high round count training and progressing their skill. That's great. It's one of the great things about the AR-15 because as that person advances their skill, they can be like, wow, this or whatever feature of the rifle is not working out for me, but it's a good thing. It's super modular because now I can swap those things out and update and upgrade the rifle to be better suited to me. That person who's doing all this high round count training, again, is probably buying 55 and 62 grain ammunition because 69 grain CR mass chains or 77 OTMs are extremely expensive. And if they're just doing a lot of close range drills and stuff like that, they're really not going to get that much benefit for their money as opposed to just running that bulk pack 55 and 62 grain ammunition, making the one in nine twist a perfectly adequate decision for them. In addition to that, if you look at how this rifle, how I have it set up with the iron sights and all that kind of stuff, I'm not going to get that much of a greater advantage out of heavier grain ammunition. In addition to that, I am that person who's trying to progress his skill. I am that person who goes to competitions and courses and all that kind of stuff. I'm buying primarily 55 and 62 grain ammunition. The stuff that I do for the channel is done with 55 mostly and some 62 grain ammunition. The one in nine twist is in no way holding me back. So... I, I kind of glossed over it in the original video, but there was absolutely nothing wrong with the twist rate. And for the vast majority of people, the one in nine twist is just fine. All right, let's talk about this light setup. This is a TMC light mount. A lot of people had questions about this and it was very apparent that a lot of you do not watch the entire video. Or at the very least, even the portion applicable to what it is that you wind up commenting or asking questions about. This is a TMC light mount. It integrates into the vent holes in the top of the handguard. I guess you could put them on the bottom too if you wanted to. It has a small Picatinny section that this light was able to connect to. This light is the Streamlight Protac HLX rail mount. It, and I have a pressure pad set up. So the pressure pad, I utilized the adhesive strip that came with it to attach it to the light mount itself. And then I ran a zip tie across the top there for some extra security. And then there's another zip tie run here for cable management back along the handguard. All right, how do I feel about this light setup? Well, I do notice that it does still wobble a little bit and I do have to come through and retighten that thumb screw every once in a while, especially if I've been like shooting around barriers and, and putting any type of like tension against this light, which does happen sometimes. And that's not a big thing for me. So I've kind of changed my, my light setup here over the years. So it used to be that like, okay, well, you know, I've got a Picatinny top rail. I like my lights up at this angle to begin with. It's, it's, a, it's a good angle for me. It's, it's very accessible um, for reasons that we'll talk about more here in a bit. But so let's say I had like Picatinny running across the top. I would put like a 45 degree offset Picatinny rail and then I would attach my light with its Picatinny mount to that rail. That's kind. That's three points of failure, which is it likely to happen? No, but are you kind of like stacking tolerances at that point? Yes. So what I've been doing here more recently which we'll see on this Daniel Defense DD M4 A1 RIS 3, previously reviewed on the channel, link in the description, is I've been removing the original Picatinny rails off of the lights that I get, and then I'm incorporating some sort of rail that first off puts the light at the angle that I want, and then also integrates into the rail that I'm using. So like this Streamlight ProTac Rail Mount 2 came with this swappable M-lock section here, which I was then able to mount to the M-lock rail. So I eliminated one tolerance stacked. I eliminated one point of failure and I've been doing that more and more. Is that something that I'm gonna come back and do on this rifle? 
probably not, probably not anytime soon. I still really like this look. I like this handguard. I like that it has the, uh, the heat shields in it and stuff like that. I, I really have no interest in changing this aesthetic. I do like that the rail puts that light out in front of my front sight post so that I'm not necessarily like lighting up my front sight post like a Christmas tree like I do on some other builds. Overall, I'm fairly happy with the positioning. It's just, uh, it's just worthwhile to kind of note something that I've changed for myself and how it is that I set up my lights since I put this rifle together. Now, going along with that, this rifle is also set up with a pressure pad. Long time viewers of the channel know that I'm not a big fan of pressure pads, but I do have a couple of rifles with pressure pads, and that's because I still think it's important to work around it. Sometimes there are circumstances that drive you towards pressure pads. So with that, you should still be kind of proficient on it. And it also gives me a, a talking point to be able to discuss this stuff with you guys whenever I do reviews on the channel. So normally I prefer clicky tail caps, and that's also why I prefer this position so that it's easier for me to be able to get the clicky tail cap with my thumb and even with my support side if for whatever reason I have switched shoulders. So kind of a case in point on the kind of, you know, moving scale of this discussion whenever it comes to pressure pads, I used to run a PEC-15 Alpha on my duty rifle and I would run off of the button on that because I could reach it with either hand on my top rail. <clears throat> Here recently, I have switched to a PEC-16 which is a much wider laser aiming module and that button is more difficult for me to hit especially from either side in the dark and all that kind of stuff it, there's a lot of surface area to try to cover to be able to get to that button so for that i will be switching to a pressure pad at some point i've got one lying around i just got to find it and then get that that system set up with the pressure pad but that's one of those kind of changing circumstances the important thing to remember with the pressure pad or even a clicky tail cap is that you need to guard against the possibility of a negligent discharge of light because given certain circumstances and regardless of it be the IR or visible spectrum, a negligent discharge of light can be just as disastrous as a gunshot. So keep that in mind whatever it is that you're setting up your rifles. Okay, that's the light setup. Let's go ahead and talk about these iron sights. There were a lot of people who had comments on these iron sights. A lot of, uh, in my opinion, very outdated opinions when it comes to the iron sights. So a lot of people were like, oh, well, you know, if you go to Camp Perry and you shoot iron sights and all that kind of stuff, the iron sight scores are the exact same as scopes. That's a very misleading bit of information right there. Though the scores may be the same, I bet you the guys with optics are doing it much faster and that has its own utility that's associated with it. Something that I have to step back from whenever it is that I'm evaluating rifles and I'm maybe not the best at doing this and this is something that I apologize for, but I look at everything from kind of a defensive standpoint and that's based on my interests, that's based on my background, that's based on my experiences. And it's important to not be slaves to your experiences, especially if you're recommending to a wide group of people. You have to be more contextual than that. You have to think through things more critically whenever it is that you're making recommendations. I don't shoot at Camp Perry, so I don't really care about the results from Camp Perry. Sure, there are guys making long range shots at Camp Perry with iron sights. However, some of the things about the shooting at Camp Perry, and this is almost a, a video completely on its own, when those long range targets are shot at, after those shots, the target is brought down and a marker is put into it that can be observed from the distance that you're shooting at so that you can make corrections as necessary. That doesn't happen in real life if you're talking about this in a fighting type purpose. That doesn't happen for real life for the average person shooting at a normal range. When it comes to making corrections, observing trace and all that kind of stuff, optics have very tangible benefits. That's just talking about long range shooting. That's not even talking about getting into close range shooting where you might want to use like a red dot or holographic sight or something along those lines. Those are faster to pick up in close range type shooting, be it circumstances, drills, whatever it is that you're doing, competitions, all that kind of stuff. It's not impossible to do this type of stuff with irons. And we'll talk about that more once we get into shooting. It's just more difficult. When you're talking about places like Camp Perry, or if you're even talking about somebody going and taking one of these rifles and doing you know, a shoot house or any type of close range drills, that is more an expression of skill than it is necessarily a recommended methodology. That's an important thing to keep in mind there. Just because I am comfortable in a specific circumstance, ex exposing my skill does not necessarily mean that it works in every circumstance. If you told me I could take this or that Daniel Defense that I just showed you into combat right now, I would not choose this. 
based solely on sighting system, not on performance. The rifle performs just fine, and we'll talk about that more as we go. When we talk about features and setup, that's what's going to drive that decision. Can you make adjustments based off your iron sights? Well, of course, you know, uh, when you're observing a target, even at an unknown distance, your sight has a known measurement to it, or you can find that measurement, which you can then extrapolate distance and be able to like do your holdovers or hold unders and all that kind of stuff and be able to make your impacts. And I get it 100%. I understand what, it, what those people are saying in those comments. What I'm saying is it's not applicable to an awful lot of people. All right, so that's the sights. And we'll, we'll discuss these sights more as we go along because I do think it's a critical portion of how this rifle is set up. Now, keep in mind, guys, I am a huge fan of carry handles. I am a member of the carry hand, handle gang for sure. I would love to have like a Colt 702 or a Car 15, an M16A2, an M16A1 type setup. I think that this has a wonderful aesthetic to it. It's very nostalgic. It's very fun. I'm all about it. We just, we gotta keep, we gotta keep the context aspect of it in sight. All right, let's talk about the sling real quick. This is a Blue Force two-point adjustable sling. I am a huge fan of two-point adjustable slings. I have quite a few different types of two-point adjustable slings. A lot of the ones that I have are padded, which I kind of complain about because they have a tendency, if I've swam through it in order to be able to do a bunch of dynamic stuff with my rifle, they have a tendency to kind of bunch around my shoulders in sort of an obnoxious way. They're a little too stiff. But that is in stark contrast to my current duty rifle that has a much thinner, lighter sling on it, which is great. It's very comfortable. It's very easy to swim out of, and it kind of just hangs in such a way that is, this doesn't bunch it up. It doesn't really like hang on me in an annoying kind of way. But every time I set the rifle down, that sling has a tendency to get wrapped around the barrel, and it's really annoying to untangle every time. For most people, that's not a consideration. If you don't carry a rifle for a living, the sling doesn't is not necessarily going to bug you in that way. If your only time that you're really around your sling is when you're on the range, you're at a competition or something like that, you may not necessarily run into those types of minutia annoyances that really only come out if you have to carry the thing day in, day out. So just a little, you know, why does that matter, Murph? Just something to consider. This sling not being padded but still being a little bit heavier is kind of like a perfect balance to where it doesn't bunch around me too much, but it is where I need it to be, you know, not wrapped around the barrel or staying fairly close to the body and all that kind of stuff. All right, guys, that's a, that's a revisit on features. How has it been shooting? When well, you're ready. Breathe.
clothes to work all the way up to my hunting rifle. Nice hunting. Is it hard to get the silencer? Uh, it depends. Now we saw in the footage there, I actually was an assistant instructor at a rifle course at one point. I took this rifle with me and I ran through the culminating exercise at the end, which was the Hilltop Humbler, which had engagements going from 50 meters out to 280 meters, shooting from a wide variety of positions and stuff like that. And that's really like a very technical form of shooting, which is my absolute favorite kind of shooting. I've actually run that Humbler three times, once with a one to six power optic, once with a red dot, and then once with iron sights on three completely different rifles. So I wanna go ahead and talk about some of the aspects of running through that Humbler real quick. First off was the tower where you were shooting from a kind of confined space in sort of unnatural positions and stuff like that. So one of the great things about the stock is that you can go ahead and adjust like the pole if you see fit in order to be able to at least have your three points of contact and try to get on your iron sights as best you can to be able to make those engagements. I had no real problem with clearing those. It is a little funky to run iron sights in those types of unnatural positions. We'll get into that more here in a bit. From there, I went to the Tunnel of Doom, which really the Tunnel of Doom is more designed for somebody with a muzzle break to kind of make them understand that muzzle breaks in confined spaces are quite uncomfortable. This has the A2 flash hider, so that really wasn't an issue for me. The only issue I had there was that the target for the Tunnel of Doom is an eight inch circle sitting inside of a car. Uh, eight inch steel sitting inside of a car and just keeping the track of like holdovers and hold unders and all that kind of stuff. I had to make a quick adjustment for my second shot. And then from there, I went to a platform that started off with a loophole adjacent to it. Once again, my light kind of got caught going in and coming out of that loophole. That's kind of annoying, but that's what you potentially face with lights. Something that was maybe a little bit closer to the handguard, like the Daniel Defense or some of my other setups, wouldn't have necessarily had that problem. And then once I got up on the platform, it was, a, it was a lot deeper into some of those unnatural positions. I had more space to be able to position my body accordingly for those unnatural positions, but it, it was getting a lot deeper or having me stretch out a lot more in order to be able to make engagements. And I did have a couple of misses. And that is, it also comes back to like being able to read impacts. You know, so if the, if the ground's muddy and stuff like that, it's gonna be more difficult with your naked eye to be able to pick out misses or if um, it's sandy, dry, if there's a lot of grass or something along those lines, it could be very difficult to be able to pick out misses. So it kind of comes back to where optics can have, you know, magnified optics can have some advantages in those types of rolls. In addition to that, getting into like, you know, rollover prone or any of these types of very contortionist type shooting positions, it becomes very difficult to try to find your iron sights to be able to align those two focal points in order to be able to make an impact as opposed to working off of you know a one power optic you know the low end of a low power variable optic or the you know a red dot or something along those lines those are a little bit more forgiving and trying to get behind them in order to be able to line up your shot to take it's still a form of low probability shooting but it's supposed to be an obtainable form of low probability shooting and i still made the hits but it's definitely more of a struggle with irons and that's the same kind of thing going into, so I, I did some rapid fire drills with this rifle here recently, and trying to get on those sights fast like you would with a red dot is a little bit more difficult with iron sights for very obvious reasons. Now there's a couple of different ways that you can do close range shooting drills like that. You can go entirely off of the front sight post. You can stack the ears of the front sight post on the rear sight, or you can, I like to pop open to the wider long range aperture and then you can grab that front sight post in your rear sight like you would with any other engagement. Of the three, I prefer the third option. The first two, I think are too low probability of shooting depending on the situation. If I was in a stack and I came into a room in a CQB type thing and I had a guy standing in the middle of the room, no cover, no nothing, I wouldn't be bothered going off of that front sight post and putting that threat down change the situation a little bit and I have somebody who does have some cover and is just exposing their head, I am less, I feel less comfortable trying to go after one of the just like flash sight picture front sight type setups and going more for finding my front sight post in my rear sight and then making my engagement there.
Just, especially when you start trying to just grab the front sight post or, or stack the front sight post real quick or anything, those types of things, you have to not only consider your height over bore, but also consider like how imprecise that style of shooting is. I'm not saying it's not applicable. I hear a lot of people espousing the values of low probability shooting here lately. I think it's very important to remember that low probability is a part of that term. And we want to do... Like there's, there are times where, yeah, absolutely. You just got to let the round fly, but there's also times where you need to spend more time trying to be a little bit more precise. So again, sliding scale on that discussion there, contextual based channel. It's one of the big things here. Accuracy wise, Murph, how has accuracy been going with this rifle? Well, I recently shot a group here, hundred yards with some uh, old box of wolf gold that I found lying around at a gun show, 55 grain. And I got this five and seventh eighths inch grouping, which isn't that good. It's actually, it's about an inch worse than the previous groups I had on this rifle. A couple things I noticed, and I don't know if this was me, the gun or the ammunition. I noticed that of the two groups that I shot this day, each one had a pretty drastic flyer. We can see that one at the top there. The first one, the first group that I shot had the flyer go off the paper. So I had to reshoot in order to be able to have five rounds on paper. And then the second one, you know, I finally managed to catch it. This four shot cluster down here is about two and a quarter inches or so. Again, we can only really work off of what it is that we have here for me to be able to show you. So, hey, uh, with this ammunition on this day with this shooter, this was the five and seven eighths inch rifle, which is not that good. I will freely admit, but I don't spend a lot of time stressing out over groups like this. First off, it's an iron sided gun, so there, there becomes a lot more onus on the shooter. So if you guys want to say that the shooter's terrible, then go for it. I'd love to see your results. In addition to that, if you get the right combination of shooter, ammunition, and sighting system, let alone rifle, every gun out on the market is a one MMA gun. And we discussed this before on the channel as well. So this is supposed to be an example more of like what you would actually have on hand and what you would do or could do in the field at any given moment. All right, guys, that's shooting. What are my recommendations for this rifle moving forward? Would I recommend this as a duty type option? Maybe not necessarily in this configuration, but I don't see a reason not to recommend this rifle for duty type use. It is made of good materials. It has performed admirably. I've had no breakages. I've had no stoppages or anything along those lines. I think this would be a perfectly adequate duty type option given the right set of circumstances. What about as a home defense, self-defense type gun? For home defense, it would kind of depend on the home. If you're living in an apartment, I wouldn't necessarily recommend this. If you lived in a house in the suburbs or something along those lines, I think it would really depend on angles. So in my home that I live in now, all the bedrooms are on the top floor. So all I really have to do is hold the staircase. And that has my rounds going in a pretty safe direction overall. Low probability of injuring my neighbors or anything along those lines. If the circumstances were changed a little bit and I had to go downstairs for some reason to police up a family member or something along the way, this may not necessarily be my first choice. Kind of, it, it kind of depends. Now, for self-defense, if you're talking about like walking around with a rifle because you're an armed citizen and you can do that, I'm not a big fan of that. So no, I guess I wouldn't recommend that. But if you're talking about like a truck gun or something along those lines, this would not be my first choice. Um, if you look at my truck gun video, link in the description, you'll kind of get an idea of what it is that I look for in a truck gun. But if your experience is entirely based around the AR-15 and you want to have a truck gun, this would be a perfectly adequate option for that. You're just going to have to take some things into mind whenever it is that you're trying to work within those confined spaces inside of a vehicle. Okay, what about as a competition rifle? Now, this is not a purpose-built competition rifle by any means. It's got like a mil-spec trigger in it. It's got these very short hand guards. It's a 16-inch barrel, whereas, you know, a lot of dedicated competition rifles are 18 inches, have full-length hand guards, have, a, you know, at least a mid-length gas system and a better competition-style trigger. But, like we talked about before, for somebody who's just starting out, this would be a pretty good option and then take advantage of the AR-15's adaptability in order to be able to make it something that'll work for them long-term. I could absolutely see somebody using this for that type of purpose. And I think it would do just fine. This would be a great beginner's competition rifle for sure. And I have taken this to competition in the past. 
Okay, what about a hunting rifle? Well, it kind of depends on your hunting laws. The previous state, a previous state that I lived in, you could hunt with any centerfire rifle cartridge. The state that I live in now, that is not the case, but you could still take this against predators. You, again, might want to kind of change how it is that it's set up a little bit in order to be able to take out like coyotes and stuff like that. In Texas, AR-15s and uh, in a variety of different calibers are still popular for like pig eradication. This would be a great use for that. I could see this being used for some types of hunting. I don't necessarily think it's optimized in that direction. Okay, well, what about as a woods gun? Now, if you're talking about like going hiking or something like that, absolutely not. But if you're talking about like throwing this across your four-wheeler or, you know, whatever, you know, your, your farm truck or something along those lines, I think it depends on what type of threats you're concerned about coming in up against. If you're worried about the threats of the two-legged variety, or perhaps if you're worried, you know, you might see like, you know, a fox or something along those lines that you want to take out before it gets in the chicken coop. Sure, this rifle would be great. If you're concerned about bear, I would prefer to see something of a larger caliber that is going to more quickly eliminate that threat than ripping off 30 rounds of 5.56 in order to be able to do the same thing that you could do with one with an appropriately paired rifle. So that's the kind of kind of sliding scale there. All right, guys, those are my recommendations. What are my uses for this rifle? Well, this is still a training tool. This is still something that I take out with me in order to stress my skill in different ways. So I have guns set up more modern with, you know, optics and lights and lasers and all that kind of stuff. But I like coming back to this to make me reevaluate the efficiency in the things it is that I do. In addition to that, this is a training option available to others. If I have somebody that I'm working with who wants to progress their skill and they're used to iron sights, but they haven't necessarily gotten into like tactical rifles and stuff like that, this is a great starting point. But an important caveat based off of things in the comments section, irons are not the end all be all when it comes to learning to shoot. It is just fine to learn on an optic. It's not gonna inhibit your abilities moving forward. Should you be able to know how to shoot irons? Sure. Are you all of a sudden gonna be this ineffective, terrible gun person if you don't learn how to shoot iron sights on a rifle? Absolutely not. It's, a, it's an extremely outdated concept and I'm really tired of hearing it. If you're trying to train somebody very quickly, pairing them with an optic is its own type of helpful. Be it so that they can better observe their impacts or they have a better understanding of how their breathing or their trigger squeeze and stuff like that is impacting their groups and their, their hits and all that kind of stuff. Optics have very tangible benefits along that route. You can get the same type of thing with irons, but if you're talking about like having somebody shoot groups with a magnified optic and they can actually see the groups form, they can really see the impact of their trigger squeeze. They can let a round go off and go like, mm, I didn't have my breathing just right and now I can see that I've got a flyer in an otherwise pretty good group. Whereas if you do that with irons, they're not really going to know until they get down there and observe what it is that was going on. And when you're talking about training, you want to get the best reps that you can in order to be able to optimize the amount of time you're spending on the range. So that doesn't mean that irons are useless. That doesn't even necessarily mean that being able to observe your impacts makes you a good shooter, as much as these are tools that you can utilize to be beneficial to the process of training. And that's the more important thing here at the end of the day, if you have somebody that you're trying to teach, that you get the lesson across to them. However it is that you choose to do that is fine. Just don't tell me that the only good way to do it is with iron sights, because I will argue with you. Well, I'll disagree with you. Which is really just another way of saying I'll argue with you, but I digress. So this is a training option for me. I have considered taking this carry handle off of here. At the moment, I'm not too interested in doing it, but as soon as I get a gun, like a 702 or whatever that has an integrated carry handle, this carry handle is coming off and I'm throwing optics on this bad boy. And better better setting it up as a fighting rifle. This is still my bare bones fighter, but I wouldn't mind, with how this rifle's set up and how it's been performing, I wouldn't mind getting this into a more modern bare bones fighter. So probably keeping this handguard, don't really see a lot of reason to get rid of it just yet. But swapping out this carry handle at some point for an optic. All right, guys, what are some competitive offerings out on the market? Well, on the one hand, you could go with um, Wyndham Weaponry, which is the reincarnated Bushmaster. It's got all the old employees and the old ownership and all that kind of stuff and are selling rifles that are 
maybe a little bit more expensive than this, but kind of in that same overall thread of sort of, you know, bare bones, old style rifles and stuff like that. Another direction that you could go is a lot of stuff out of the PSA catalog, which some people kind of scoff at PSA. When it comes to their AR-15s, I've seen very few issues with their ARs. Their AKs and stuff like that, they did kind of use the wider public as their, you know, product testing, which I don't really agree with, but I'm more accepting of PSA doing that than I am of SIG doing the exact same thing by like a lot. PSA has a very wide product category that you can get a lot of pretty good rifles, some of them better configured than this one for very low prices. So I know I didn't necessarily pick out specific rifles from either manufacturer, but either places would be really good places to go look as a competitive offering to this Delton. All right, guys, I think that pretty much covers my thoughts on this particular subject. I hope you guys found this interesting and it's pretty much what I got. Have a good day.